Hello, and welcome to the UIM webinar series. This is Jim Rush, editor of UIM. My pleasure to introduce today's presentation on condition assessment of force mains, which is being brought to you by Pure Technologies. Uh, we have a tremendous turnout today. I'm pleased to announce that there's more than 425 people pre-registered. Uh, as many of you know, assessing force mains is a critical, critical concern considering that wastewater utilities are under increased pressure to inspect and proactively maintain their buried assets. Condition assessment of gravity sewer pipelines has generally, generally become a standard operating procedure for many utilities, but assessment of force mains presents different challenges. Force mains can be configured so that inspection using conventional methods is not practical. Uh, for example, access points can be spaced too far apart, or lack of redundancy may prevent uh, taking the pipe out of service. Additionally, potential problems with pressure pipe may not be identified using conventional methods. Our presenters today will review the threats to force mains and discuss how a condition assessment program can be structured to determine if these threats are adversely affecting the condition of the pipe. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to introduce the speakers. They are Mark Howley, President of Pure, pipe Te or Pure Technologies U.S., who is responsible for many of the non-destructive testing and monitoring technologies used to identify leaks and perform condition assessment of large diameter pipes. Through these efforts, he has grown Pure Technologies into a world leader in the condition assessment of large diameter pressure pipes for both water and wastewater applications. We also have Michael Higgins, Vice President of Pure Technologies U.S., who has uh, been responsible for managing nearly 50 condition assessment projects on large diameter TCCP water and wastewater pipelines. He is intimately familiar with the deterioration processes of these pipelines, the capabilities and limitations of the tools used for their assessment and making management recommendations to ensure their safety. Uh, finally, we have Robert Morrison, principal in the firm of Jason Consultants Group, LTV. Uh, he has more than 40 years of experience in the pipe industry, including the manufacturing, development, design, and installation phases. Uh, Bob is responsible for Jason Consultants Pipeline Inspection, Condition Assessment, and Pressure Pipe Rehabilitation Services. He is also one of the principal authors of the latest ASCE Manual of Practice on Pipeline, Installation, Inspection, and Acceptance Testing. And he is uh, also working on the Water Environment Research Foundation Project uh, Guidelines for the Inspection of Sewer Force Mains, which is due out in December. Uh, before we turn it over to the presentation, I would like to remind everybody that there will be a question and answer session following the presentation. To ask a question, you simply type the, or click on the question mark icon in the lower right hand portion of your screen. That will open up a, a Q&A panel and you can type your question into that, uh, into that panel. Uh, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, but we will be addressing the questions following the presentation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Mark Howley. Mark? Thanks, Jim. And uh, just certainly on behalf of uh, the panelists here and myself, I wanted to thank everyone for taking time out of the busy day to uh, participate in our webinar. It appears based on the attendance that uh, the topic condition assessment of force stains uh, may be timely. And uh, again, if, uh, if there are questions, as Jim pointed out, we'll be happy to address them after the presentation. Or again, you can reach us offline and we'd be happy to follow up with you then. Uh, to get started, Started. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is just give a, a quick overview of who Pure Technologies is. Um, again, just review quickly the current state of the infrastructure and, and why we're having this discussion today. Uh, at that point, I'll hand things over uh, to my colleague Robert Morrison, who will provide a, more of an overview of the pipeline prioritization plan and what can be done. And then subsequent to that, Mike Higgins will pick up and uh, you'll speak to some of the condition assessment tools and technologies, and we'll wind it up uh, for uh, conclusions and questions. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Pure Technologies, we've been uh, in business since 1993. Our uh, technology was originally developed to monitor post-tension buildings. Uh, we've developed acoustic techniques to evaluate where and when wires were breaking in post-tension buildings. That technology transferred well to uh, suspension and cable state bridges. You can see in the left photo where we monitor the main cables of the bridges. 
And then sometime around 1997, we began to work on uh, solutions for pre-stressed concrete fills of pipelines. And uh, today, pipeline condition assessment represents about 70% of our business. Uh, we remain dedicated to developing cost-effective solutions for infrastructure management. And uh, in addition to the technology's capability, we recently um, have expanded our uh, engineering uh, side of the house. Um, Openaka Inc. is a specialized uh, consultant, uh, primarily involved with condition assessment of pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. Uh, both Openaka and Jason uh, consultants provide engineering services and are national leaders in condition assessment since uh, the early 1980s. Both firms provide hands-on solutions for inspection and management of large diameter pipes. And in addition, Jason Consultants have been a prime investigator, as Jim had mentioned, for several water, wastewater research foundation projects, including uh, the evaluation of innovative inspection technologies for wastewater systems, inspection guidelines for force mains, and also they are the lead on the EPA task order on rehabilitation of water wastewater systems, which published uh, the, the state-of-the-art technology of force main rehab recently. Uh, just uh, touching on the state of the infrastructure, uh, I think everyone understands that a lot of the infrastructure was built out uh, some 40, 50 years ago or longer, and uh, we're now recognizing there's a need for condition assessment and evaluation and prioritization of the uh, capital expenditures for replacement or rehab of these lines. The ASC report card is well respected, and uh, certainly you can tell through the slides here that uh, there are significant capital requirements. Uh, we've heard numbers as high as $2.5 trillion uh, to upgrade uh, the United States uh, infrastructure over the coming years, and we believe that proactive condition assessment represents one of the best hopes for coping with these great aged and deteriorated uh, pipeline systems. Um, in concert with what's going on at ASCE, uh, the Congressional Budget Office has uh, been doing uh, their own research, and uh, it appears the estimates in the order, annual budget order of 13 to 20 billion will be required uh, just in, in wastewater systems alone. Again, uh, quite a, a daunting task when you look at uh, things from a North American perspective. So um, for this reason, obviously, condition assessment of uh, both gravity force mains will be necessary to prioritize spending and maximize uh, CIP funding. Uh, the presentation today will focus on tools, technologies that are currently available for condition assessment of wastewater force mains. And with that, I would like to hand the baton off to uh, Bob Morrison, uh, who will provide an overview of our force main assessment program and uh, give you some of the highlights. Bob? Thank you, Mark. Uh, this will take a second just to uh, switch here to a uh, different slide presentation. Here we go. Okay. Um, before I get started, I just want to uh, make a little introductory uh, comment. I know there's uh, a large group of you who have probably done some condition assessment of force means and perhaps others that uh, are relatively uh, novices uh, to this field, so hopefully this presentation will uh, appeal to uh, both groups. Um, before I get started, I think it's important to kind of give a little bit of an overview of the sewer force main market so we know what kind of challenges uh, we're going to be faced with. Uh, based on our research, uh, we find that the, uh, there's approximately 60,000 miles of sewer force mains in the U.S. network, which represents about 7.5% of the uh, wastewater network. So in, in uh, in comparison to the gravity wastewater network, it's a relatively small portion of the uh, network. However, uh, in our opinion, it uh, poses equal or greater challenges uh, due to some of the operational and environmental problems uh, that a failure in a force main can create. For example, as perhaps some of you know, unfortunately, the cost to clean up a, a spill can be very um, expensive, kind of to say the least. And, uh, Oftentimes, to a if it's a very large diameter uh, sewer force main, it's, uh, it's a critical uh, component in the operation of your wastewater system. And so any outages can be uh, catastrophic from that perspective as well. Unfortunately, uh, very limited if any inspection has been carried out in the past on force mains. Uh, part of that is due to the fact that, uh, as I said, these mains are critical. It's 
very difficult to shut them down for sometimes, uh, you know, not more than a couple minutes at a time. The presence of inline settings uh, makes it very difficult, for example, to launch any kind of a, uh, intelligent PID that might transverse the uh, pipeline to, to collect uh, performance data. And also, um, here to far, there hasn't really been a lot of equipment that's been uh, suitable for inspecting force mains. Most of the um, uh, tools that are available in our industry have been more suited for gravity uh, inspections, but uh, this is changing, fortunately. Uh, there's no, now a lot of new tools that are coming into the marketplace uh, that can help us. So. There we go. Okay. Uh, as Mark was saying, uh, we've done quite a bit of uh, research work for the Water Environment Research Foundation. And as part of that research, uh, we conducted a survey of um, wastewater utilities in North America. And this is uh, going to be reported in our report, which I understand is due out sometime in the uh, end of uh, December. Uh, but essentially what we found is that over 60% of the uh, sewer force mains in, in the uh, North American market are ferrous materials, and most of those are cast iron and dust iron type. There's also um, a very large percentage of these mains that are relatively small diameter. In fact, over 50% of these force mains are uh, 12 inch diameter or less. So we're dealing with primarily small diameter uh, service pipes. However, there's also um, a large percentage of other materials. For example, the uh, second highest material is PVC pipe, as you can see in this slide, with a little over 14% of the uh, in-place market, followed by pre-stressed concrete solar pipe, uh, a little over 11%. And then a product that sometimes we tend to forget about, uh, since it hasn't been produced in the U.S. since about 1983, and that's asbestos cement pipe. But uh, there is 5% in the ground asbestos cement pipe, uh, which in some cases uh, does have to be uh, inspected and, and assessed. There is some good news, uh, and the good news is we're looking at a relatively young product. Uh, especially compared to uh, water mains. Over 98% of the underground uh, sewer force main market is less than 50 years of age. So compared to uh, water mains, where roughly 50% is uh, older than 50 years, uh, we're dealing with a relatively young product. The other good news is that uh, obviously most of these types are buried, as you can see in the uh, graphic on the right, over 91% of this pipe tends to be buried. But of the buried pipe, a uh, large percentage, two-thirds, is in undeveloped uh, grassy areas. So sometimes uh, access external, uh, externally is uh, quite, quite possible. So that kind of gives a little bit of an overview of um, the, the size of the market and uh, some of the uh, focuses of, uh, of our research attention in the past. I'm sure now uh, very few uh, utilities have unlimited resources, so going out and embarking on an inspection program that would uh, look at 100% of your, your underground assets is uh, nearly impossible. So the focus really needs to be on looking at and examining only those force mains whose performance is really critical to the operation of the wastewater system. And one technique for doing this, which was really uh, originally developed and refined by the oil and gas industry, is what's called uh, risk-based investigation, as is shown on, on this particular slide. The, the objective of a risk-based investigation is basically to look at two things. What is the likelihood of a failure in the force main, and what consequences would arise if I were to have a failure of that have that force main. And what we're looking to do is to find a smaller subset of the entire uh, force main population that should be the focus of our investigation and assessment activity. Because as I said, uh, I don't think anybody has enough resources to, to examine 100% of, of those resources. So in terms of likelihood of failure, uh, failure can be characterized as either a structural failure, 
such as a rupture in the pipe, or it could be an operational type failure, such as a leakage um, um, or a loss of capacity, for example. The chart that you're looking at is primarily based upon uh, ferrous materials, but obviously this approach can be used with all different types of materials. But in the case of ferrous materials, uh, typically they degrade from either external or internal environmental corrosion causes. And in fact, in our uh, Water Environment Research Foundation uh, research, it was reported that uh, approximately 20%, 26 percent, sorry, of the structural failures that occurred in cast iron and ductile iron pipes were due to internal corrosion, and 19 percent were due to external corrosion. So internal corrosion tends to be the biggest culprit uh, in this particular uh, market. And looking at the uh, other side of the equation, the consequences of failure, it's uh, best um, if these can be ranked in terms of cost. Now, the direct cost to um, associated with a failure occurs to be rather easily uh, estimated. Uh, for example, repair costs um, or the cost to clean up um, from, the, from the failure can also be readily uh, calculated. But a little bit more difficult sometimes is the so-called social economic costs. These uh, require a little bit of more imagination to quantify. Uh, examples of some of those costs might be uh, Costs associated with traffic disruption, uh, closing of local businesses uh, as a result of a failure, or even uh, third-party claims. Um, so once you have done some kind of an assessment of the likelihood of failure and the consequences of failure, uh, then you can, and I think it's often helpful to uh, look at it in terms of assigning some kind of a risk rating. Uh, to, to those variables. Uh, this is also sometimes called a critical factor, and essentially it's nothing more than um, the product of the probability of a failure and the consequence of a failure. This uh, matrix that I'm showing now in this particular slide is quite simple, where we have essentially just rated the uh, likelihood of failure and the probability uh, or the consequence of failure, uh, either low, medium, and high, and we've come up with uh, nine different uh, panels in this matrix, um, depending upon whether it's a low consequence or low likelihood of failure. Obviously, anything falling into the uh, block uh, uh, with a number nine, which would have a very high consequence or a high likelihood of failure, should, should receive the first priority in terms of any inspection, while uh, pipelines falling into the block labeled number one, could be, you know, but largely uh, ignored. This uh, slide um, presents kind of a suggested methodology for going about carrying, carrying out an, an inspection and condition assess, assessment. Um, as I said, the initial process is to do a risk assessment, and this is primarily a desktop evaluation. Uh, where you are collecting, uh, you know, information that's easily collectible, such as the uh, uh, diameter, the type of material, the age of the pipe, the length, uh, operating and surge pressures that, that might be subjected to uh, this pipe. Um, this this work is the uh, the first step. After this is carried uh, conducted, the next step is to put together a investigation plan. The investigation plan is going to depend upon the type of material to be inspected. Obviously, as the deterioration mechanisms that affect different materials will have a bearing on what type of tools uh, one wants to use to, to inspect uh, the, the particular product. But once the inspection is carried out, the data is collected, analyzed, and the remaining life uh, determined. Normally, this also requires some kind of statistical interpretation as um, as I said before, it's not really cost effective to try and go out and inspect 100% of the pipe surfaces. So I mean, essentially you're going to be maybe uh, inspecting 10 or 15% of the critical main and then using that data to interpret uh, the um, performance of the, of the entire pipeline. And then depending upon the outcome of your analysis, uh, it may be appropriate to look at uh, various rehabilitation strategies, such as repair, replace, renew, or even monitor uh, the pipeline. 
Um, this is just a chart I just like to throw in here just to kind of give you some idea as to what type of information you want to collect uh, during your desktop evaluation. It's broken down into basically four different categories, uh, type characteristics, service conditions, um, the environment, and then the social economic um, conditions. And then over on the left-hand uh, side, I've shown some of the potential sources of this information, including GIS, uh, geodatabases, uh, record drawings, um, operation and maintenance uh, reports, stuff like that. One approach uh, which we found um, helpful in terms of carrying out a risk assessment is to uh, create what we call belief networks, which actually take their uh, origin from uh, Bayesian statistics. And a belief uh, network is really nothing more than a systematic way of identifying those factors, or indicators as we call them, that one reasonably believes will have a predictable outcome on the type's performance. Uh, this is a uh, technique that's used quite often in the geotechnical industry. And uh, we tried to apply that to uh, doing condition assessment work on um, force mains. And in fact, um, if you get a copy of the water environment uh, report that Mark uh, mentioned before, entitled the Inspection Guidelines for Force Mains, uh, you'll find a uh, quite a detailed write-up covering covering this approach. Unfortunately, there's not enough time uh, in this brief uh, webinar to uh, kind of go over that, so I would refer you to, to that. A um, similar approach can be used also for looking at the consequences of failure, where we've established a uh, belief network for that, and, and this particular one would be applicable to any type of material, whereas the one I just showed you before would be more appropriate for uh, a ductile iron pipe, for example. So once we've done the risk assessment, then we need to decide, okay, uh, what kind of inspection tools do we want to use uh, in this pipeline? And here it's, it's important to take, take a look at uh, the performance of the particular pipe uh, that, we're, that we're dealing with and what factors have an impact on its uh, ultimate uh, performance capabilities. So this particular charge is just an attempt to try to systematically uh, look at uh, look at different, the different variables. Uh, we have operating pressures, uh, external loads. These are creating uh, stresses uh, in the pipe. Uh, potentially, the pipe has been weakened due to exposure, or corrosion, or degradation, or due to uh, inherent flaws that may have been created during the manufacture of the pipe. That combined with these uh, operational and external loading. Um, may in fact create an overload on that particular pipe, which obviously would, would lead to a failure. So this is kind of a systematic way of uh, kind of looking at those uh, factors that would affect it. And then once we've done that, and we've decided what kind of, uh, uh, based on the deteriorating mechanisms that that pipe uh, would face, we take a look at the various inspection techniques or technologies that, that are available to us. And these can usually be broken down into both uh, internal and, and external um, tools. The, of course, external tools tend to be somewhat non-intrusive, uh, whereas internal tools uh, are going to be intrusive just by, uh, by nature. Uh, this list is by no means all-inclusive, but it does highlight, I think, some of, the, um, some, some of the major inspection techniques that are out there right now, and I've tried to... Uh, also identify the different technologies that, that they can be applied to. And at this point, I'd just like to kind of highlight a couple of these um, that may not be familiar to a lot of um, consultants uh, and uh, utility owners here, here in, uh, in North America. Uh, but the first one is uh, linear polarization resistance, LPR. And LPR is uh, basically an electrochemical trial test. Um, and this technology has been developed in Australia. And it's basically carried on a teacup size um, sample of soil that can be collected from along a, a pipeline. And it will tell you um, not – basically there's a correlation between the results of the LPR test and the rate of corrosion in that ferrous pipe. So this is a very important tool that uh, we're starting to uh, see be used here in, in the U.S. and has – and uh, widespread use in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and uh, some, some parts of Asia. 
um, some other tools that are uh, more relatively new, and that's uh, rely upon what's called the remote field or near, near field technologies. Uh, essentially, uh, these are electromagnetic tools that can be used to uh, measure the remaining wall thickness in, in a ferrous pipe. And uh, there's also been some work done in the UK uh, using remote field technology to actually measure the remaining wall thickness in an asbestos cement pipe, uh, one that is empty. Um, so there's, there's some work uh, going on there that will be of some interest, I think, for those of you who have AC pipe in your, in your system. There are some also uh, intrusive external uh, inspection techniques. Um, for example, uh, removing either a coupon from the pipe wall or a pipe ring sample, uh, which can be used to check you know, for evidence of internal corrosion, uh, spot checks on wall thickness, or even uh, measuring some of the mechanical properties uh, would obviously be uh, intrusive to the performance of a pipe. Uh, but, but these are uh, important uh, techniques that uh, will be used and can be used uh, for uh, assessing the condition. And then we have the internal uh, tools, and these, as I said, tend to be intrusive or minimally intrusive, although some can actually be launched now in uh, live uh, sewer force things. Um, some of these also are common to uh, tools that are used for gravity sewers, for example, CCTV, uh, laser and sonar profilers. Uh, a few of them can even be, um, as I said, introduced live into a uh, force main uh, system. Uh, the problem with that, though, is there are very few force main systems that are, uh, you know, have been designed with a pick launcher and retrieval system. So it makes it very, very difficult sometimes to uh, to use these intelligent takes in a in a sewer uh, or force main environment. But there are a couple uh, that I'm going to talk a little bit about later and show some examples. Okay, so those are some of the tools. As I said, it's important to know what kind of material you're dealing with because that's going to have some, in, some bearing on the type of tools that you might want to use to carry out your condition assessment. I have a kind of a series of slides here that I'm going to try to jump through um, that you can go back and I think look at uh, later uh, that highlight some of the um, some, some of the uh, so-called indicators, um, factors um, that indicate that there is a deterioration taking place, for example, in the, in the pipe. The slide you're looking at right now is based on cast, cast iron pipe. So in the case of cast iron pipe, for example, uh, we know it's subjected to both, or could be subjected to both external and internal corrosion. Um, obviously, in the case of external corrosion, it's the uh, soil properties that would impact um, the rate of corrosion that we might experience. So over on the methodology column here, I show some of the tools that can be used to kind of measure that um, and, and so forth. And cast iron tends to be a brittle material, so it's, uh, um, it's subjected to or can be subjected to um, a brittle rupture, for example, if it's subjected to surge pressure. So um, the next few slides, as I said, we'll uh, focus a little bit on looking at some of the indicators and the methodologies that can be used to uh, measure those indicators and are indicative of uh, performance issues with a pipe. I just wanted to jump ahead a little bit to, as I said, asbestos cement pipe. Um, there are a couple tools here that are, that are now being used in Australia, for example, uh, one of which is to take coupons, uh, taps, hot taps even, from the uh, pipe wall, then exposing these coupons to uh, xenophailing or the universal indicator which measures the alkalinity in the material, and uh, this is then uh, correlated very closely to the tensile strength of the material. Also, you can take the uh, coupons that have been cut out of the pipe wall, and you can do what's called an indirect uh, tensile, I should be strength, not strength, but anyway, an indirect tensile strength test on that coupon. So, th so there are some uh, technologies now that uh, are available to us to try to evaluate uh, AC pipe. Uh, PVC pipe, as we know, is not metallic. It doesn't corrode. So it's you know, obviously not affected in the same way as some of these other materials. Uh, however, um, there was a report <coughs> published by the uh, AWARF um, a couple of years ago dealing with the long-term performance of PVC pipe. And essentially what they found is that um, the long-term performance of PVC 
is really uh, driven by the rate of crack growth, uh, which develops at a defect or a void in the pipe wall. Uh, these defects or voids are microscopic in size. Uh, they're basically created at the time the pipe is produced. And the thing that arrests or, de or um, tends to slow down that process is the fractal toughness of the material itself. So in terms of evaluating a PVC pipe, we want to look at both the size and distribution of voids or defects in the pipe wall, as well as the fractal toughness of the material. And then we have uh, first just concrete fill in the pipe, which I'm not going to talk about because I know Mike, uh, Mike's going to uh, deal with it more about that when we talk about some of the inspection technologies. There's a little poll that just popped up there that you might want to respond to. We would appreciate it. Um, just a couple of other uh, technologies that I thought might be important just to highlight. Um, when you're dealing with ferrous pipes, particularly if they're bonded joints, uh, one one te technique for locating areas of active corrosion is to do pipe to soil uh, potential surveys where you're measuring the potential difference between the pipe itself and a reference electrode, usually copper copper sulfate. Or if the pipe is not bonded, um, electrically continuous, uh, then you can do cell to soil uh, potential surveys, which are not quite as accurate, but also but they are effective, uh, physically similar approach. I already mentioned uh, coupon removal, which can be very effective with the cement cement pipe, but also allows you to look and see if you have any internal corrosion on uh, other types of pipe materials. Uh, pit depth measurements is very important if you're dealing with cast iron pipe and steel pipe. Um, basically, the, um, um, there's a ASME code case, uh, D31.1, which is a standard published by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and it basically allows you to predict the ultimate tensile strength of a steel pipe based on the size and distribution of pits in the steel pipe. So uh, this can be a very effective tool for determining if you know something about the rate of, rate of uh, growth of uh, pits in, in the pipe, uh, you can determine uh, what the... Um, um, what the remaining life might be of that of that steel pipe, uh, given the uh, uh, known operating conditions. It also can be used with cast iron pipe. Uh, the national uh, this is some research done in Canada by the National Research Council. Similar approach, looking at uh, the effects of pits on cast iron pipes, and there's been uh, some publications that uh, deal with how you can correlate pit depth and pit dimensions to the uh, underlying cast iron uh, ultimate tensile strength. Uh, quickly, ultrasonic inspection. This is probably the most common tool that I think a lot of people have used in the past for uh, trying to measure the uh, remaining thickness of a ferrous pipe. It could also be used, obviously, on, on other types. And um, one of the drawbacks is it doesn't work on uh, cast iron pipe, and also it uh, needs to be in intimate contact with the underlying uh, surface of the pipe, so you have to remove any coatings and linings. I'll skip over that slide. And then the last kind of uh, family of technologies is based on using electromagnetic theory, which essentially creates an energy uh, and any current field that flows through the pipe at the, uh, along the pipe outer surface and then is detected uh, by an antenna. And then this can be correlated to uh, not only the thickness of the pipe, but also can be uh, correlated to the uh, some of the properties of the pipe, if it's graphitized or not. Um, one uh, technique, technique is called Sea Snake, which is based on remote field uh, technology. And then there's uh, broadband electromagnetic, which is uh, a little bit different than the Sea Snake uh, in that the, broad, the broadband uses a um, variable frequency, which can be modified to suit the type of material. And, and because of that, it basically uh, you can filter out any uh, unwanted noise and improve the accuracy of the results. In both cases, uh, you can end up with a, uh, a diagram or a chart that looks something like uh, what you're looking at right now, which is kind of a contour plant of the contour plot, I should say, of the wall thickness of the pipe. It's you know, basically looking at a pipe that's been un unfurled, the wall, and made flat in, in two dimensions. Uh, but it's very helpful in terms of picking up patterns. For example, you can see here that there's uh, 
and from the corrosion along the inside of the pipe. So that's um, kind of an overview in 20 minutes or more of uh, condition assessment. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mike Higgins, who's going to talk about um, some of the technologies. Uh. Thanks, Bob and Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, albeit virtually. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are used to gather in, uh, information on uh, a, pre uh, a force name. Um, and the outline you see before us is the sort of order I'll go through. Uh, first talk about trapped gas and leak detection tools, then talk about tools for pre-stress concrete cylinder pipe, and very briefly cover uh, long-range CCTV technology and some test and soil sampling programs. So that's uh, the order we'll go through here. Um, first, uh, we'll talk about a convenient tool to find pockets of tra uh, trapped gas and leaks uh, in, in pressurized pipe. Um, the technology we've been using is called smart ball. And essentially what it is is a uh, instrumented ball that's inserted into the flow stream of a force main. And it allows you to roll with the flow in the pipeline and capture at a point downstream. Uh, data is collected from the ball and can be analyzed to identify and locate leaks and pockets of trapped gas in the pipe. The ball, uh, as you can see in a photo on the left, essentially consists of a, a two-inch aluminum alloy shell that contains a data acquisition system, and it's surrounded by a foam shell that provides additional surface area to propel the ball, as well as provide a, a quiet traverse of the pipe so we ascertain high-quality acoustic data. The ball is typically inserted through a four-inch uh, outlet on the pipe and uh, is negatively buoyant, rolled through the pipe. Um, can roll through many miles of a force main uh, and be captured at a point downstream to survey the pipe. Um, essentially, there are two ways to insert the smart ball technology into a force main. The first method um, requires what I call minimal interruption to the force main. Uh, so if you take the force main down for 15 minutes or so, uh, you can isolate a pump, remove a flange from that pump or, or the piping connecting to the pump, insert the ball into the pipeline, replace the flange, turn the pump back on, and begin the survey through that method. If it's not feasible to take the pipe out of service for that duration of time, you can use a second method, which is uh, we use commonly, uh, which is inserting the ball through a four-inch or larger uh, top outlet on the pipe. Uh, we can insert, insert, uh, install a stack of equipment on the pipe that's pressure tight, insert the ball into the stack of equipment, operate a series of valves, um, and push the ball into the pipeline and allow it to traverse the pipe through that method. Um, both methods have been used uh, quite extensively on, on sewer force mains. Capturing the ball uh, is a bit more challenging. Um, here are some photographs from uh, typical uh, projects where we've captured the ball. On the left side, upper left, you see a, a customized built net for a specific project. And this is how we prefer to remove the smart ball device from force main, um, allow the ball to enter a point of gravity discharge either at a manhole or a treatment plant, and build a customized net to the dimensions of the uh, outfall, if you will, uh, allow the ball to roll in there and capture. And here you can see the ball actually in the, one of the technician's hands in the bottom left photo. Um, another technique we can do is actually uh, insert a expandable net through a four-inch or larger outlet. Um, we try to avoid that in force mains just because we can follow the net. Uh, once the ball is in there, you can pull it into the uh, retrieval stack, close the valve, and pull the ball out that method. But again, the preferred approach is to allow the ball to flow into a gravity portion of the main. Uh, while the ball is in the pipeline, um, what is happening with the ball is it's rolling uh, on the bottom of the pipe. The ball is slightly negatively buoyant. It's traveling very close to the flow velocity of the pipe. That ultimately depends on the slope of the pipe, but it's, it's fairly close to the flow velocity. The ball itself emits an acoustic pulse every three seconds. Uh, that pulse travels the pipeline, and we're able to place sensors on the pipe that can detect that pulse. So as the ball is rolling through the pipe, we're continuously tracking where it is with these sensors, um, and the technicians will always know where the ball is in the pipe. Um, 
the ball itself can record data for up to 12 hours of time. Uh, so you can do very long pipelines with a single deployment. The longest sports game uh, we've done with the smart ball technology is 12 miles. Uh, usually they're a mile or a few miles, but uh, you can do very long pipelines conveniently as well. Uh, this is a plot of what the data looks like. Um, the acoustic data in its raw format is shown in the upper uh, plot here, and you can see the background noise as, uh, as the ball is rolling through. As it approaches the leak, you see a clear crescendo as the ball passes the leak, and then the acoustic activity tapers off. The bottom plot also shows the same uh, same leak, but has a frequency data overlaid on top of the leak. That frequency information is very important for finding leaks and pressurized pipe. Um, what I have on the right, and I hope this works for you all, I'm going to play an audio file of a leak and a pressurized pipe. I, I, because of the setup here, you, I can't play it through the computer. I'll play it through the phone, and hopefully it comes through okay for you all. Oh, bear with me a second here. Got to get the right file. When the file starts, you can already hear the hissing sound, but you can also hear the ball chirping and the hissing sound growing in time. So at this point, the ball is past the leak and, and the acoustic energy tapers off. The next file I'll play for you is an air pocket in a, in a force main. And again, hopefully this audio works for you. So you can hear it with that file a very uh, quiet sound as the ball is rolling through the pipe, and then as the ball enters into the uh, pocket of trapped gas, you can hear it dripping from the top of the pipe and some turbulent flow and so forth. Um, with respect to leaks, we can also estimate the approximate size of leak by looking at the acoustic magnitude. We can also uh, estimate the length of the air pocket in the pipe. The longer air pockets are obviously of more concern. Uh, just to summarize the abilities of the smart ball technology, first of all, it can report the location and magnitude of leaks in a pipe, reports the location and length of air pockets in a pipe, and because the ball is rolling immediately adjacent to leaks, the sensitivity of small leaks is excellent with this technology. It can identify leaks down to 0.15 gallons per hour under ideal conditions, and that's, that's uh, low background noise and, and some significant pressure on the pipe. So. It gets to a point where the leaks you can detect with this device are below what an agency might be concerned with. And as I pointed out before, many miles of uh, pipe can be surveyed with uh, one deployment of the smart ball device. I'll just show you a very interesting quick case study with the smart ball tool. This is a force main we uh, surveyed in Grand Forks, North Dakota. We looked at eight miles of force main uh, between 24 and 36 inches. The majority of the main was a concrete pipe, pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. Um, there were six pockets of trapped gas that were detected during the smart ball survey. Um, and you can see the ball ca captured in the lower left photo. Uh, one of the locations of trapped gas, the, or the agency was able to CCTV the, the location. And you can see a photograph on the right of the slide that shows H2S corrosion on top of the pipe. Um, you can also see a pit in the pipe at that location. And what, what you're actually seeing there is the pit has grown uh, through the concrete lining through the steel cylinder, and you can actually see the pre-stressing wire of the pipe from the inside of the pipe. Certainly an, an area of concern for this particular force made. So that's a great application of smart ball and, and one that uh, we see quite common now. So that's sort of uh, detecting uh, gas pockets and leaks and, and pressurized force main. I'm quickly going to move to uh, assessing pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. Uh, Pre-stress concrete cylinder pipe relies on the high-strength steel wire to provide its structural uh, capacity. Um, the, the wire is, uh, provides the strength for the steel cylinder in there that provides basically a waterproofing membrane, but overall the wire is what really provides the strength of this pipe. Um, this pipe has performed very well uh, over the years. There's been very few failures per mile, in fact, fewer than any other type of pipe material. Um, however, it's often used for large diameter force mains, so the criticality of pre-stressed pipe force mains is usually higher. 
Um, one of the interesting things that we've seen with pre-stress pipe force mains and pre-stress pipe water mains is that the problem sections tend to be isolated. You can have a pipe with a significant corrosion problem. It's two neighbors on either side of it are in perfectly pristine condition. Uh, the next bad pipe might be a half mile or a mile down downstream or upstream. So it's a very isolated problem. So it's uh, important to use tools that can find the needle in the haystack, if you will, and find these problematic locations. Typically, we see about two to five percent of of a pipeline, or the pipe sections in a pipeline or main may have some damage that would warrant uh, some deterioration in the pipe. Um, and one of the interesting things we've seen is that that damage can be managed rather than replacing the main. Um, in some cases, we've seen agencies sort of jump to replacing a pipeline that had some problems in the past. However, uh, these problems, given the small percentages, the problems can be managed rather than replacement, and that offers a significant capital cost or capital savings. Here are some of the threats to pre-stress pipe. Uh, typically, uh, uh, a lot of the condition assessment programs are focused on the first two bullet points, which are wire break damage. Those are external corrosion mechanisms for pre-stress pipe, um, uh, and it's, uh, both corrosion and hydrogen brittlement both result in wire break damage, which reduces the strength of the pipe. The, if that continues to occur, the strength of the pipe can reduce, be reduced to a point of failure. Um, H2S corrosion is similar to what we just saw in Grand Forks um, as an internal corrosion mechanism. Um, that would be typically addressed with the smart ball technology. So I'm just, just going to use a few slides that are going to address wire break damage either due to corrosion or hydrogen embrittlement. The, the first slide uh, is related to electromagnetic inspection. If a pipe can be removed from service, this type of tool gives you an excellent baseline assessment of the condition of the force main. What this tool is, it comes in a variety of uh, configurations, but essentially one coil is placed on one side of the pipe, and a receiver coil is placed on the other side of the pipe, and a, a magnetic field is inducted, uh, induced on the pre-stressing wire. The wire carries a field to the opposite pipe, and it allows us to obtain a magnetic signature for every pipe section along the, along the pipeline. Um, we can evaluate those uh, magnetic signatures to identify broken pre-stressing wire wraps and provide an estimate of how many wraps are broken. And obviously, the more wraps you have that are broken, the uh, more significant the damage on the pipe. Um, it's an excellent tool to get a baseline assessment of a pipe. However, it does require the pipe be removed from service. For large diameter pipes, we have tools like the one on the right. For smaller diameter pipes, we have a robotic uh, technology that can drive the uh, coils and uh, data acquisition equipment through the pipe. For this type of inspection, this is typically you know, a very broad summary of what we would see. Here is a pipe of about six and a half miles. 1,500 of the pipes had no wire break damage or in very good condition. Three pipes had enough wire break damage to place those pipes close to failure. Um, 76 uh, pipes, or about 5% of the pipe in this case, had what we call moderate levels of damage. Some uh, wire break damage, however, didn't place the pipe at immediate risk of failure. So when you're making an engineering decision regarding a, a pipeline, this can be, these pipes can be very difficult to evaluate. One of the things that might be advantageous to decide when you, which pipes you need to repair is to do a finite element model of the pipe that will tell you at what number of broken wires should we intervene. So if I have five wire breaks, the pipe might be okay. If I have 40 wire breaks, however, now I need to intervene. So going through finite element modeling, we can develop curves uh, like the ones you see here that will help uh, tell you which pipes need to be repaired and, and which are okay to operate. Another tool for condition assessment of concrete, uh, pre-stressed concrete pipe is acoustic monitoring. And one of the advantages of acoustic monitoring is it can be deployed while the force main remains in service. And it's really a fascinating technology that relies on monitoring the acoustic activity in a pipeline to hear or detect the snapping sound of a wire breaking. So it reports the time and location of wire breaks, tells you which pipes are having wire break activity, the rate of wire break activity. It can be used in a short-term fashion. We can put, deploy this equipment for, say, three months, identify problematic pipe sections and take the equipment away. Or it can be used in a long-term fashion in a, in a smart pipe concept where we continuously monitor the condition of the pipe and raise flags as pipes meet certain criteria and so forth. Um, and as I mentioned, this technology can be installed while the pipe is in service. Um, in a long-term structural monitoring application, 
uh, acoustic monitoring can keep uh, track of wire break tallies. And you see a plot here below that the blue line shows a 96-inch diameter pre-stressed pipe. The bars on top of the pipe are the number of wire breaks on the pipeline. So as the system detects new wire breaks, these bars grow with time, and they're color-coded to calculate the risk on the pipe. So it keeps a, a near real-time risk evaluation of the pipe and enables an agency to make fast, sound decisions on the pipeline to uh, identify any pipes that might be approaching a point of uh, needing repair. Um, a convenient way to make this information available is through web-based reporting. Um, this is an email that's sent out when a client has a wire break on a pipe, and it pops in the log on a website that would offer information that would look something like this, and here we can see for that 96-inch pipe, every pipe section where it's located in the world, and the number of wire breaks on a pipe, where wire breaks have been occurring, and so forth. Here's an example of a 66-inch force main where the uh, fiber optic uh, acoustic monitoring technology was installed while the pipe was in service, and the thumbtacks are wire breaks that are occurring, so you can identify the problematic locations of the pipe. So that covers some of the uh, pre-stressed pipe tools. I'm next going to move into uh, CCTV of uh, force mains. And really, this type of technology is talking about gravity and force mains, but most conventional CCTV systems can't inspect long pipelines. The, the, the length of the robot or the tool can be deployed a few hundred feet. Uh, we've just developed a technology called pure robotic um, that can put, do long range surveys and put multiple sensors into a pipe so we can use a camera to provide CCTV, a sonar head to provide profiling underwater. Uh, a laser to provide profiling above water, and electromagnetics, as I just discussed, to detect wire breaks in pre-stressed pipes. The tether length on this device is about 8,400 feet, so from one manhole you could quite easily, uh, depending on the configuration of the pipe, run the robot a mile one direction and a mile the other direction, so you might go to two miles from one manhole. And the pipe, uh, minimum pipe diameter for this tool is 12 inches in diameter. Um, lastly, I'll just cover test pitch and soil sampling as a uh, together. Um, test pits have been used uh, for a number of years to look at uh, pipelines and try to ascertain some information on the condition of the pipe. Essentially, it involves digging the pipe up, inspecting it, sampling it. Bob, Bob spoke to much of these uh, inspection techniques. It provides excellent information on the pipe, excellent information on the pipe that's exposed. However, the sampling percentage is very small, so it can give you a false sense of hope or a, or a, a false sense of worry for a particular pipeline. Uh, based on such a small percentage. Uh, we've been uh, strong believers of finding some way to screen the uh, pipe, uh, either through reviewing asphalt records or doing a smart ball survey or internal inspection so you, you know better where to excavate the test pit so you get more out of the test pit program. Um, and one word of caution is that whenever you're doing a pipe under pressure, you have to use extreme caution. If the pipe deteriorated, just taking the soil load off the pipe could cause the pipe to fail. Um, and lastly, soil sampling is a very convenient way of determining the aggressivity of the soil on the pipe. The photo shows a very large test pit and one of our engineers taking a soil sample. Um, this could be done with augers or other equipment that's much easier to use. Um, and as Bob mentioned, there's some new test methods that might indicate the likelihood of corrosion for metallic pipe. So lastly, this is some conclusions uh, for our webinar here. You know, assessing force mains, one of the things we wanted to leave with you all is now it, it is certainly possible to assess force mains, even with logistical restraints of many force mains. Um, the technologies and methods for assessing force mains have come a long ways in the last few years. Um, however, it is important to note that all technologies have limitations. So when you're implementing a condition assessment program, it's important to understand the capabilities as well as the limitations of the technologies and methods you're going to use and build programs around those capabilities and limitations. And ask your technology providers for those limitations. We're, Pure Technology is certainly a, a technology provider. We, we operate under a policy of being very forthright and honest about the limitations, and uh, that's an important component of any uh, condition assessment program. So with that, I'm going to try to turn things back over to Jim. We've been receiving a, a number of uh, comments, so hopefully, Jim, you can you can hop on the line here, and uh, we can answer some questions of the participants. But, and I thank you all for your attention this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have time for a few questions here. Uh, this first one relates to uh, SmartBall. 
uh, is familiar with the smart well being used for water pipelines, but uh, how extensively has it been used for force names? Like how many how many miles has it completed? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the smart file tool was developed in 2005 to 7 and really commercially available in 2007. It was initially designed for water pipes and uh, all together in all the types of pipes we surveyed, it's up to about 700 miles of pipe that the smart balls can run through. Uh, in force mains, we've done 14 force mains with the tool now, uh, probably on average maybe two or three miles of force mains, so somewhere between 30 and 50 uh, miles of force main have been surveyed with the smart ball technology. So it is, it's newer to the wastewater world, but it is, uh, certainly used there. And it, in some respects, force mains are a bit easier for smart ball than water mains. Okay. Uh, what is the minimum, minimum operating pressure smart ball can detect leaks in? That's another good question. Um, uh, pre the, the pipe has to have some pressure to generate the acoustic activity uh, associated with a leak in a pressurized pipe. So uh, typically we, we like at least 5 PSI. The, the higher the pressure, the more sensitivity the device has to find smaller leaks. For pockets of trapped gas, the pipe just needs to be full, um, and it, or supposed to be full in a force main, and if, if there's pockets in the force main, we'll hear the noise associated with the, with the pocket of trapped gas. But for leaks, we like at least 5 PSI. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time, but if you do have any final questions, we can address them offline, so go ahead and, and get those in uh, before we sign off. You can get the, the type of questions in using the, the Q&A panel on the, the lower right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get the next question in here. Uh, can you place an acoustic fiber optic cable inside the force main? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So, uh, the, we've done that in two force mains now. Placing a cable in an active force main is... Uh, is more challenging just because of all the debris and stuff in the force main, but it has been done in two instances at this point. One's up in Michigan, another in New Jersey. Okay. Any thoughts on why external corrosion of PCCP is more common in the water industry than in wastewater? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep answering, I guess, is that uh, water pipes are typically operate at a higher pressure, so usually, uh, just intuitively, would require fewer wire breaks and a higher pressure pipe to generate a problem. So force mains are usually operate at lower pressure and therefore require more time. So the external corrosion factor uh, in force mains is still there. So the issues associated with water mains are still in force mains. So it just requires more time to develop. And we have now seen a few cases where that wire break damage has caused failures of uh, pre choice pipe force mains. Okay, that brings us uh, to the end of our hour. Can, one final uh, comment. Do you, uh, can you visit offices, somebody's office, if uh, they have questions regarding this type of technology? Yeah, and the contact information is on, on the screen still. And that's why we do this, of course, is uh, trying to get the word out about our company and what services we provide. So if somebody would like one of uh, the presenters or one of our colleagues to visit with them, we're happy to come in and provide a a similar presentation in, uh, in their office or in more of a closed environment. So uh, we're certainly happy to do that. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and again, if uh, your question was not addressed during this uh, Q&A session, uh, they, they will be addressed offline. Uh, again, I would like to thank our, our speakers today, Mark Holly, Michael Higgins, and Bob Morrison, as well as our sponsor, Pure Technologies, for bringing us the webinar today. Uh, this the presentation will be archived and available at uimonline.com within the next day or two, and any uh, registered attendee will get an email notifying them when the, uh, the archived presentation is available. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. We look forward to having you in the future UI, UIM.